Today we're going to be doing another history video and talking about illuminated manuscripts. And of course I'll be joined by the very talented secret scholar ASMR. Now, if you don't know what an illuminated manuscript is, it's basically an animated or illustrated document from it could be, of course, specifically from 13th to 15th century, but they're found even back in the ancient Egyptian times. Now, I don't want to tell too much because the Secret Scholar is going to share with you many more details about how these are created, but we're going to go over all these drawings here and talk about the various imagery that's used and what it means in the history and of course the day in the life and how these beautiful pieces of art were created now those were just photos of documents that were larger and part of bigger pieces and a secret scholar is going to share those secrets with you right now let's go during the early and high Middle Ages, books were a luxury item, highly prized as well as expensive and time-consuming to produce. Items only kept by monasteries that collected and copied them, such as Chartres, or wealthy nobles, kings and emperors. At the beginning of the 15th century, a group of scribes in the region between Strasbourg, Heidelberg, and Colmar, speaking the Alsatian dialect, were about to change all that. They hired themselves out to an atelier that would produce a great number of illustrated codices over the next decades. By the 14th and 15th centuries, commercial workshops like this had increased in number and production, with increasing literacy, affluence of the cities, and the growing demand for books. On a September evening, Hans Kohler sits together with two of his colleagues, Johannes Ziegler and Thomas Vogel de Valencia, enjoying some free time and conversing about their work. All fairly young, they still have good eyesight and a healthy constitution that ensures their endurance for long hours at a desk with only candles or what sunlight there is to light their work. It's early to bed for these busy scribes before the invention of the printing press and movable type around 1450. The only means of book production and copying was by hand of a scribe. This was a tedious and time-consuming task that meant long hours hunched over a desk with rudimentary tools. Scribes could be employed privately, by the church, or by the city, and not all were literate. Before 6am, Hans is awake and dressed, a modest woolen tunic for the cool autumn day, as well as a cap to fend off the cold of the workshop and perhaps some fingerless gloves to keep his hands warm whilst writing. He has a breakfast of bread, milk and cheese and begins his day at his desk. Scribal desks were not like those of today. They were large wooden lecterns with angled work surfaces. This allowed more arm movement to produce lettering and a better angle for pressure on the quill. Space was not always accommodating, depending on the scribe's rank and means. And still, many young scribes did their work, standing at these desks, or surrounded by various book stands. Although parchment had been widely used for manuscripts, paper had become more widely available by the 14th and 15th centuries. 
At first, paper was considered not as strong or long-lasting, and was usually only used for administrative records, merchants' accounts and sermons. But by the 13th century, Italy was producing paper of increasingly good quality, and paper mills followed in France by 1340 and Germany by 1390. This paper, made from linen pulp and much stronger than today's variety, was being used to produce quick, cheap editions of manuscripts. The parchment provided a more flexible writing surface, paper was cheaper to produce, weighed less, and was able to be supplied in sheets of exact format for manuscript production. Papers were formatted into a clutch containing eight leaves, or four bifolia. These clutches were assembled in a sequence of series of smaller units on which scribes and illustrators worked, a clutch at a time. To produce a clutch, or choir, paper was folded much the same way of booklets. Most books will contain several choirs bound together, a pile of sheets of paper folded in half. Another way sheets would be gathered would be by folding them in half repeatedly, making quarto and octavo gatherings the individual pages of which had to be separated or cut with a knife. Medieval manuscripts were foliated rather than paginated. This means that each leaf or folio, rather than each page, was numbered. A particular writing space was indicated by the leaf number, followed by either recto, facing page, or verso, its reverse or back. Hans inspects his clutch for the day, and the exemplar or original for its content, noting where he left off the night before. He writes the text, using colour for headings and initials. Those would have been added later by the rubricator, if there was one. In this atelier, Hans and his colleagues write the rubrics in red themselves. Sometimes texts were copied from another book, the exemplar, and sometimes the text was read aloud to multiple copyists, so that more books could be copied at once. Hans assembles his equipment, inks, knife, quills, pots of water, a bone or metal stylus, all of these things are maintained by himself for the most part, mixing his inks and hand-cutting quills. In Western Europe, the preferred writing tool was the goose feather quill pen, made from the primary feathers and plucked from the live goose in spring. Those feathers on the left wing were prized by right-handed scribes as they curved away from the face and eyes. Inks were made in several ways, by mixing gum and water. Inks for parchment utilised a more acidic iron gull, or tannin mixture, which actually burned into the surface. But this was not necessary on paper, which was more permeable. Each time a new batch of ink or a new quill was used, it can be seen in the text demonstrating how individual this work was. Hans sees to it that he has a good supply of inks, and that they are all consistent and liquid. He checks the sharpness of his penknife, and makes any adjustments to the nibs on his quills. There is not much room for error, as there was no way to erase mistakes on paper the way a blade could scrape ink off the parchment. So the work is meticulous. A stylus rubbed in graphite is used to score lines and patterns, showing where lines and columns should be. Hans then sets himself to his task of writing. In this stage of production of the manuscript, Hans and his colleagues write in plain ink, fixing titles and initials in red, 
although there are very few initials in these editions, to keep the work quick. They leave space for the illustrators to add pictures. Headings are implemented in red as directions and descriptions for the illustrators, allowing the illustrators and scribes to work independently of one another. It is thought that three groups of illustrators and painters worked closely together to produce illustrations in this workshop. As soon as the main text is finished, the illustrators can begin their work. Nearby, Johannes works on a text of a hagiographic work, the Elsässische Legende Aurea. Like Hans, Johannes has written his name into the text at the end of works, in a plea for the reader to remember the scribe. The clutch moves from the scribes to the illustrator, streamlining the traditional parchment copying practice of the rubricator, inserting color initials, headings and notes, and marking the first letter of sentences with a red dash. The illustrator is responsible for all the artwork in the manuscript, including borders, flourishes, illuminated initials, and miniatures or pictures and illustrations. Sometimes different illustrators specialized in different parts of the manuscript, such as sketches, backgrounds, people, animals. These are some photocopies of pages from a manuscript that was made in the early 15th century in a region of the Alsace. We notice some things that are quite different about this. We can see the colors are more watery with a limited palette of yellow, green, and red on this particular one. This one is Aeneas, a Middle High German version of the Aeneid. The author of Aeneas was Heinrich von Feldecke, and this was a 12th century composition. Here it has been copied for this manuscript that was ordered by a particular patron or customer, and we can see that the illustrations encompass the page. There's no box in which they fit, but there are these red ink rubrics telling the illustrator what to draw there. And we have some very interesting things happening as well. There are several interesting things about this manuscript. It was written on paper rather than parchment or vellum. And we also have the actual name of the copyist or the scribe on the last page. So in the pages of this Codex Palatina Germanicus 403 on folio 255 recto. We have the end of the poem, right, and um, a little prayer or a plea for some to remember the scribe in prayer. Let's read it. Dies Buch wird ausgeschrieben von Hans Kohler, 
this book was copied out by Hans Kohler. Uf, mit Wuch, vor, St. Gallen Tag. On Wednesday, before St. Gall's Day, in dem Jahr. Um, do man zahlt von Christus Geburt. So in the year that is counted from Christ's birth. Christus here with the X that was common in late classical and um, medieval times to write with an X as a cross. Christus. Um, du sent. So, twelve, a uh, few hundred und neunzehn Jahre. So, that would be the year 1419. And we have here, um, hat das Buch ein Ende gebot uns im Wessen Sende. Amen. And here the red rubric. Uh, bittend Gott für den Schreiber. Amen. Please pray for the scribe who has written this book out, copied it out. So there we have the name Hans Kohler. And there are some more from this workshop that he was party to. This one is another little prayer or asking the reader to remember the scribe in prayer. And this one, we have a name, Johannes Ziegler. This is from the Codex 144, the Legenda Aurea. This one is folio 412 verso. And there you can see that the illustrator of this work was very similar. We have some very interesting pictures happening here. There's a horse and we have just stripes of watery color ink. Here we have blue as well with a limited palette again. And again we have Another scribe, this time Thomas Vogel de Valencia from the Codex 359. And this is the Lucidarius. So you can see this scribe has a slightly different style. We still have the limited palette. And there are some interesting things about these scribes and the work that they've produced. So together with Nathan ASMR, we're going to explore a little bit more about this intriguing workshop. So that was extremely fascinating. It's so amazing to hear about the lives of these incredible people. And now seriousness is going to go out the window because I'm going to talk a little bit more about the imagery that we're seeing here. The fun, the raunchy, the f disgusting, weird, and we're going to talk a little bit about what these things mean, and 
also kind of related to today because what I think you see today is that this coloring of the emotion that people, you know, we often see in the past in black or white. And this is a way you can share in the humor because humor is something that's timeless. And there are things that are just infinitely funny. But also the human mind is capable of weird and fantastical things. So let's scroll through a few pages here and find you can actually see here. This is an example of a larger manuscript. You can see this little illustration here. Now, let's go to some of the fun stuff here. Now you can see this one here it has dragons in love. I think that's pretty self-explanatory, just uh, anthropomorphizing these dragons, who are, of course, mythical creatures. Okay, next we've got this one. Now we can see what he's doing here, and to this bowl. And um, I think this is just basically um, scat humor of some sort. It's um, pretty baseline, but... Again, you can really see it's it's not new. It's not new. It's been done before. All these jokes have been done before. Okay, let's move on to the next one. Now, this is an interesting one here. Now, you can see this is a picture of a monkey. He's shooting an arrow into this other monkeys. You know what. Now... What's interesting, besides it being hilarious, is the usage of animals in these drawings. Um, animals, of course, are hilarious but and amazing, but I think there's something about that uh, anthropomorphization of animals and kind of the irony. And now we're going to see some other examples of that, but you do see some themes Snails. There's a lot of snight and snail battles. Um, there's a lot of monkeys, rabbits. Um, and again, I think that's the irony where the rabbit, which is a typically timid prey, becomes the predator. So there's some irony there, and that's funny. Now, there are origins in the Egyptian times. Um, weird drawings like this. You can see this one's kind of just, I mean, this is like a young Mike Flanagan here. This, uh, look at this creature. I mean, it looks like a, a ray of some sort, but like a ray if it was like a demon. So that's pretty scary. Um, but again, so there are scary the creatures that you do see. Um, and I myself, when I doodle, sometimes those things happen. Now, this one is one of my favorites. Here we are. Now, this one, I don't know if you can see that. You can see there's a king. He's sort of on the side there. And um, he's looking in on the uh, dragon with the uh, queen. So there's some sort of just kind of a funny situation there. Um, the irony, and he's just kind of looking on, and the, the dragon is kind of giving him a look like, you know, what? <laughs> so that's kind of funny. But uh, I think there's definitely some, you know, propaganda that goes into some of these drawings here. And, um, of course, like those kind of things, I'm not sure which king that was, but it's, you know, implied, just an implied weakness. So next we have the horse and bugle, which I think is just a timeless classic. You know, I don't think it gets pretty, gets pretty basic here. Um, and uh, 
just a, a really funny looking drawing there. And who hasn't thought about, you know, what that might sound like. Now this one is kind of unique because it is blood that's coming out here. Um, I don't know exactly if I could really analyze this except that um, clearly he hasn't had it with this woman here. That's about all I can say there. Next, we have this one. And this is, uh, again, I think it's worth mentioning. It is pretty hilarious and juvenile, but even in the ancient Roman times, um, if you've been to Pompeii or things like that, um, phallic humor has always been just something in history that has existed. And you can see it, little kids just doing it. It's just something um, something interesting there, biological perhaps. Um, but those phallic symbols are always there. And that's kind of what this tree is here. So pretty, pretty wild right there. Now again, this one goes back to the a monkey. And um, again, like I said, a lot of the choice of animals have origins in the Egyptian religion. And uh, uh, that was sort of co-opted there. Um, some of these kind of drawings as have continued from the 1300s and onward. And of course, in the Victorian era, we saw um, definitely some removal of these kind of uh, drawings. Now, one thing that's very interesting before I jump into this is that, um, you know, you find these little um, marginalia, as they're known, uh, in biblical texts. And you find them in um, decrees, you find them in all sorts of different uh, illuminated manuscripts, and that's what makes it interesting, is that uh, this isn't just limited to one uh, type of document. So again, you see that universal, um, just the crude humor and you see that kind of just reflected um, in these kind of crazy drawings. Now this one is kind of the rabbit scenario I mentioned earlier where the rabbit is a weak animal. And again, I believe, I want to say there's some sort of Celtic uh, connection there and that does have some um, Celtic origins for some of these creatures that are chosen. But you'll see here just the turn of the irony um, where the rabbit is chopping the head off the hunter. So the hunted, the hunted, the hunted becomes the hunter, as they say. Now this one is just a classic here. You can see this is the king, and he's just had enough as well with these ladies here. I'm guessing, I'm guessing this didn't work out too well for him, just in terms of his, you know. Um, next we have this one here. This is kind of ridiculous as well. Um, you can see here, it's pretty self-explanatory. These two lovers, he's clearly jealous. And, uh, you know, who hasn't felt that way sometime in the past? <laughs> Something like that. Um, again, we see this is kind of a weird one. Uh, two just are disembodied, headless, tightrope walkers. Now, these are sort of just, again, examples of weird, bizarre, so you think of crazy movies like Inception or things like that. And people are having pretty crazy wild thoughts even back then. Okay, we have another phallic drawing. This one's pretty wild, to be honest with you. I'm just going to put that up here. Um, you can kind of see it's, it's pretty nuts. It's pretty self-explanatory as well. Um, kind of reminds me of a phallic never-ending story. Um, that dragon character. I forget his name. Here we have a king begging to this um, cleric, it looks like here, this priest. Again, a lot of um, clerical, church related uh, marginalia out there. Next, we have this here. It's a pretty crazy one here. It's like a demon boy. And, uh, a boy, dog, or rabbit, and uh, yeah, pretty. That's pretty wild. So I've included this drawing here. You can see um, this is pretty standard, typical, and of 
course, crocodiles or alligators were known, but you can see these were a reflection of reality to some degree. So that's very interesting, but um, it wasn't just wild and fantastical or crude things either. This one's pretty wild, um, pretty much the stuff of nightmares here. Uh, this bird and man here, I'm sure we can see that. Um, I'll just do a little close up there because it's pretty much a nightmare. Um, but uh, again, you can see this sort of reversal and again the phallic symbol, with, of course, that as well. So, I mean, I think that there's really some lessons to be learned because, you know, while these things are kind of crude humor and they are funny, of course, um, they offer insight and color into the world of the past. And the way that we interact with the past is so important because sometimes there's a barrier where we feel disconnected. And sometimes this kind of simple humor, child, even though childish, it's something innately human um, to have to be funny and have just find humor in a lot of these situations and that's something very beautiful so that all said i want to say thank you and thank you to secret scholar please go check out her channel and i'm really looking forward to seeing you on the next video take care